hi guys so so in this video i will show you how to perform a, an indentation test simulation in abacus uh, this is the, all the data i got for, was from someone and they just wanted to see how it can be done in abacus and also we are not discussing so if you're not familiar with nano indentation or micro indentation you look you basically use it to find the mechanical properties of a material using these kind of tests such as hardness and other other mechanical properties when you're doing fe analysis it is very important to, s to carefully select the resolution of the mesh because depending on the tip of the indenter you need to decide about that so we are not going to cover those parts i will show you how i meshed it here and also for mashing you can look at uh, my other video in which i showed you how you can improve use different types of mashing strategies to mash apart successfully using hex values okay so there are two things you need to do or two parts you have to create in this case we have used a uh, berkowitz type indenter which looks something like this so it has a tip here okay the other part is the sample where you will do the indentation in this case it was a cylindrical sample 30 by i think 50 by 50 millimeter or, or 30 by 50 millimeter so uh, again have a look at that if you want to so so this is this is what i have created as a representative of that so again dimensions are not important it's all about how the whole process really works so based on your own indentation test you can decide about it also you don't have to model the whole thing if your indentation is very small area then maybe you need you can reduce the size of the whole sample if you want to if and if you see the stresses and deformations are not really propagating through the whole sample so you can decide based on that otherwise it will take a long time to simulate okay so what i did was i basically had an this indented geometry from in solidworks and it was a step file so i i went to import and I imported it as a part so I went to the part and I had this you see I had this step file so I imported it and I got this kind of part here right so you can make it in SolidWorks or any other CAD software or you can get the geometry from somewhere else and you can import it here because Abacus can import different formats of geometries if you want to for the cylindrical specimen I basically did the same strategy as I have been doing before so you can see it's a deformable part so if i if i can show you how i did it i just created create part i selected 3d deformable solid and then extrusions and then i went to this and so what i did was then i created a cylinder uh, circle sorry and with this dimensions which were prescribed to me in this so i'm just showing you how it was done so that you you, know, you are familiar with that and then once you press done it will ask you for the depth so if you give it the depth it will create a cylinder which you see on the screen as part two here okay the important part here is when we will come to the meshing we need to create a mesh which is very fine at the center and maybe outside or away from the indenter we don't need very fine mesh so i had used some strategies here by partitioning the geometry and you can also use different strategies to come up with this kind of thing again again the, i don't think this mesh is optimized because you are dealing with a nano indentation and all the displacements and everything are everything is in nanometers so you might have to go very small or fine mesh at least near to the tip of the sample okay so next thing was the properties in this case what i have done is i have defined only one, one material property but you can define it for both sample and for the indenter since I'm going to make the indenter rigid so it doesn't make any difference so what I have done is I have used the properties of approximate titanium here and I'm not describing the whole curve of the plastic part of this thing but I'm just assuming it to be a linear case okay and everything is in everything is defined in micrometers here so the units are based on 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 those micrometer scales so what I have done so I have done everything here on this way then i yes i create a solid section so i just create this like creating this selecting the material and this way i have i have this solid section section one and then i assign it to the solid so i assign it to this part and i am assigning the same properties to this part as i said you want to have a different properties to that and you want to keep it elastic you have to create a new material create a new section 
and assign it to this part separately okay but in this case i am assigning it both the same properties because i will make this part rigid and then then is assembly assembly module so if i go to the assembly module you can see i just press the instance part and i can bring both parts in the in the window here and then i can move around this part to bring it to the location where i want so i created a origin here at this point and i move the tip of this indenter to the origin so that it's almost in contact with the sample before it starts simulating okay now the step definitions and for step definition i have used a static step and i'm defining again it depends on if it's a rate dependent material you might have to go to the total time i'm assuming it to be a rate independent material so i am using 1.5 second so what i will do up to 1.0 second i will indent or move this indented inside the or in the downward direction to make create an indentation and for the rest of the half of a second which is 0.5 second it i will move it back or it will retract my indenter so which is normally what you see in in real case that it goes up the, the if you plot the force and displacement curve and then it goes down because you are unloading or moving it back other than that if you look at the step i have used total time of this i am using again a large number of increments to avoid it to stop if it requires more steps than more number of increments than this then in initial increment size i've used a smaller one because initially it will be trying to establish the contact so i want it to be like going like this and also the maximum i kept it to 0.1 to get at least a reasonable number of outputs from my simulation other than that i have not changed anything in this case then i went to the interaction that's a tricky part now because we need to define the interaction between the sample and the this so what i did was firstly i created two surfaces and i call them master and slave so my master surface is always a stiffer surface and my slave surface is generally a softer surface i would say or less stiffer surface so you can see my slave surface is the surface of my sample so i selected the top surface of my sample and for for the master surface i selected the tip of the sample so if i can show you from the zoom view then you can see it's this that it's this surface which will be in contact with the sample in reality so this is how i did that sample surface definition because once i go to the contact definition so i can define the interaction since i'm using static so i can i don't have the option for general general contact which is more mostly available in advocacy uh, explicit so what i have done is i have created a contact condition by creating a contact i select a surface to surface contact here and when i press continue i will get this type of window where it asks me to select a master surface so my master surface is this one my slave surface as you remember is this one and i only select it directly from from those surfaces when it gives me the list of that for interaction properties i have defined it by using this create, create interaction properties here you can also define the interaction properties using this option here so you can say create interaction properties contact conditions and then tangential behavior i have used it as a frictionless and for normal behavior i have used a hard contact again if you know the friction coefficients and everything then you can make it more accurate okay those contact conditions are very important for these kind of models okay and that's pretty much it so my contact is defined so now abacus will know that this the surface of the indenter which is on the bottom will be in contact with the top surface of the sample here and you can see when you create this both of those surfaces are highlighted with interaction properties one which are frictionless while normal contact is hard contact okay so when you when you say about hard contact this means the contact pressures will be computed based on the stiffnesses of the individual materials right so i hope you know that if you are not familiar with that look at the abacus documentation the other thing is as i told you i'm going to make this whole thing rigid so for that what i have done is i have created a constraint which is called a rigid body constraint what you have to do is you have to create a constraint you press this create button you select this option here and when you select this it asks you to select few things so what you have to do is you have to first select the body so i will select for example this body here as you might see so i select this thing here and then the next thing you have to do is and the next thing you have to do is a pick a point with which you want to keep constrain it so for that i have selected this rigid uh, reference point which i showed you before and that's how you have 
created a constraint and you can see it's, it's a constraint between these two and it's a rigid body constraint so everything is rigid now and this reference point is associated with that so whatever we do with this reference point will happen to the whole geometric area of the indenter only how to create the reference point if you're not familiar with that you can go to the parts and if i want to create a reference point you go to the tools and select the reference point and then you say you want to select replace the existing one because there is already one if it's if this is not there then you can still it will give you an option you can select the point where you want to have that reference point and it will be there okay so i'm not going to change it here i'll keep it as it is and then i go back to the interaction and this way i have the contact definition and also the rigid body definition constraint definition so that's what i have done now the next step is the loading condition so what i have done in this case is i have fixed the whole geometry at the bottom and for that if you look at this so this is my first boundary condition i have applied so in this case i have fixed everything in x y and z direction at the bottom so that's fine and then on the top what i have done is i have first fixed the reference point in one which is x y which is this direction and also all the rotations because it can still rotate right so i have fixed all the rotations as well while for vertical motion of this i have defined another boundary condition and in this case i'm using a distance of 0.2 uh, micrometer which is around 200 nanometers which was given to me since i told you that the total time i'm using is 1.5 second and until 1.0 it will increase or it will move this thing down up to this displacement value and then after one second it will start or retract it back retract it back okay or move it back so after one after one second it will move it back so that we can see how much unloading occurs in the material okay so to do that obviously if i i have two options one is the ramp option which is the default option in a static analysis so instead of doing that i have to define an amplitude function you can define it directly here by creating an amplitude function in a tabular form and again i have discussed about the temp uh, this this amplitude function in the, my cyclic loading video which is on the top so have a look at that and what i did was i said okay at zero my amplitude is zero and at one second at one second my amplitude is one this means it's up one times 0 0.1 0 0.2 and then at 1.5 second i want it to go back to the initial state so i say go back to zero right so this way i think it will go downward and then in after one second it will start moving back again okay so that's what i have done in this case and that's what this amplitude 2 is all about so i have defined it in this way and if you don't want to unload it you can just push it and then you can leave it there but you won't be able to see the un elastic unloading of that indentation if you when you in reality when you move the, the indenter back you have some elastic unloading as well okay then you go to the mesh part which is the important part now so for for this case i think it's a rigid body so i just use a normal seeds like one, one 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 micrometer or something or one millimeter or something and then i matched it and it, it worked fine so my indented is rigid so and also it's, it's mostly straight lines at the bottom so we don't need to really worry about the mesh otherwise if it's a curvature somewhere there then you might have to be careful about that but again you can play around with the match sizes here and see if it really influences your results or not because matching is very critical in this it's when you go to micro and nano scale your deformations are moving from continuum to discrete scale or atomistic or molecular scale sometimes so in that case it is very important that your your mesh is conforming to those length scales as well so sometimes you have to go to a very small match size now comes the important part so in this case you can see what i have done is i have used a radial mesh here and also if you look at the near the near, near the indenter I have used a very fine mesh here and what you what i have done is basically i have partitioned the whole thing as as a circle here and it goes up to a depth of around this one because i i found out that it the deformation was i was able to see the stresses and deformation up to this depth after that it was not significant so i can use a coarser mesh there so that's what i have done here and also i use a radial mesh so that it can increase or outwards because there was not much of a variation of stresses as you go on and you will see it later on as well 
so if you look at the geometry of this whole thing which I have shown you here in the parts so you see what I did was I created this datum planes you can create the datum planes here you see this is a create datum plane option so you can I created a datum plane along yz plane one more along xz plane again I have a video on that so I told you about meshing so have a look at that and then I created a datum plane along this line this was a depth I wanted to select up to which I will have a fine mesh and after that I can use a coarse mesh and also I have created a partition using this sketch option here this one I use this sketch planar option to partition the cell and then I just extrude it up to this depth although it can go up to the end as well so again you can optimize if you want so once I have done that then I can have a very fine mesh at the center and then I have a radial mesh as I showed you before other than that there was no important aspect here so meshing is a very critical again I'm emphasizing on mesh because you are working with that okay so I go back to the mesh just show you what I did so I use to have different meshes everywhere I use the edge edge thing edge so you can see I have applied an edge seat I selected the appropriate size here you can reduce it further if you want also you can basically you can see I have used for the whole model just to show you what strategy I have used so I have used hex mesh and as is so I'm using default option I have never tried any of these option fancy option which you which you can play around with so, but it works so partitioning really helps in uh, helps have a CAE to mesh it more in a more better way but you can again play around with different algorithms as well also for the element type again you can see I have used 3d stress elements which are linear again you can use quadratic elements as well especially in the middle if you are not able to refine it to get better accuracy of the results so that's what I have done here so my, I have a mesh again it's an optim not an optimized mesh in my opinion you can use a kind of a bias here as well but I will leave with that and I will leave it for you guys to explore more if you're interested okay then what I did was to go to the job and I submit right so when you submit the job it will start running and let's monitor it I ran it last night and it finished so I started at around as you can see at around six o'clock and it finished at four o'clock so you see with this this kind of mesh it took a long time to simulate and I, I don't think it's an optimized mesh so again meshing optimizing the mesh will definitely improve the total time so it, it took a long time to simulate in this case especially the mesh of the sam sample here is, is critical so please pay attention to that now if you so I ran it and it took long time so now I'm going to just show you the results of it so you can see there are stress values again these are Newton per micrometer square because I'm using micrometers as a unit in this case but you can you can convert them whatever you want and if I look at so in this case I have already removed it so I add everything here so you see this is rigid so I can't see any stresses here this is a rigid part which has saved some time for us but again this mesh can be optimized okay I'm emphasizing again on that but I hope you don't mind it but it's an important factor especially in this area so I will remove this component here to see what is the stress underneath it so I will just remove this by selecting creating display option and I will press remove and it's gone so now I can see what's happening here uh, what I will do is I can also remove the mesh to see it more clearly so let's do keep it like this okay and you can see I have indentation there and I have I have something like this so again I have selected the edge option so if I remove that edge option three edges there it should be more clear okay and you can see the indentation is there you can plot plastic strains if you want and you can see how it looks like see from the top as well so if I plot from here for example just this one maybe yeah so you see it's a very small area so you can make a small very small sample as well and keep save time as well so it's just to show it's just for demonstration purposes again you see it requires for the refinement because you have a stress variation among the inside the elements as well so you need to work on the meshing as well all right the important part now is you normally see uh, a different type of curves for for these kind of tests so generally if you look at the literature uh, this kind of curve that so you load the sample and then you unload it so you see this kind of response right so
So you want to see that kind of responsive? I just showed you on the Excel sheet. So what you can do is you can bring back everything, indenter and everything, and I hope it works. Yep. And then I will create. I will uh, because since I was applying boundary condition on this reference point, so I can take the reaction forces and displacement of this reference point. So I can go to my uh, XMAP data manager. I already have done it, but I will show you again how you can do that. So you can say create uh, from output the field variables. Then you can you have to select unique nodal here. Then you select which reaction force you want. So you want reaction force in three directions. So I have selected three RF3. And also I need a displacement, right? So I have selected U3. Then you select that specific point. So in this case, I'm trying to select this point just to make sure that it's selected okay. So I will just see if this is the point. Or maybe I'll try this view. It seems like that I have selected the same point. So I will just save it. And I have those points, right? And then I can create. So if you plot this now, so you see it's a the, your reaction force is a function of time, right? But I need a force as a function of displacement. So again, I have a video on that. So have a look at that, how you can do it. But I will show you here as well. So you can, it will save you some time. So what you do, you go to, to, go to create, operate on XY data, and then click on that. And now you say combine. Since your displacements are negative x or y direction could be in negative direction as well so i'm using a combined option and then I, I normally prefer to have it positive so i use an absolute value of u3 as an x coordinate then i can have a comma here and then i can use an absolute value of displacement and then i save it as xy data 2 and now i have xy data 2 which should be force as a function of displacement so you can see it shows a very, very much similar trend. Results might not be very different. In that case, it was around 5,000. In this case, it's around 2,000 uh, micronewtons or something like that. So this is newtons, I think. So in so you see, I mean, it's working fine. So what you have to do now is you, you see trend is very much the same. Simulation is working fine. You have loaded it and then you've retracted back your indenter. So the best thing now would be to play around with the material parameters, contact condition and meshing to fit it better and that will take you there or whatever you want to do with this and you can identify the material parameters or properties through it so i hope this makes sense and if you have any question then comment on it and we will i will try to answer it too okay good luck and thank you very much